you feel that you are unlucky when making hiring decisions? Have you ever hired someone and then within a few days realized that it wasn't the right fit? Would you like to avoid some common hiring mistakes? Would you like some tips on how to improve your hiring process? Well, you are in the right place. Today, I am interviewing Nelson Scott, and we're going to talk about interviewing right to hire right. Welcome to Practice Management Nuggets podcast, practical practice management and privacy tips to help you start, grow and improve your healthcare practice. If you are a clinic manager, team lead, healthcare provider or practice owner, these practical tips will save you time and money. My name is Jean Eaton, your practice management mentor and your practical privacy coach with information managers. I help you manage the pink elephant in the room. Let's get started. Today, we're going to talk with Nelson Scott, who is an expert in hiring employees and a coach for managers who need to better be prepared to manage employees. Welcome, Nelson. Thank you for joining us to the podcast. Thank you, Jean. Good to be here. Thank you for the invitation to join you. I'm delighted to have you on the podcast. We talked on the podcast on the first episode in in 2014. That's how long the podcast has been around for. But it's time to do some updates about hiring people because our environments have changed. And I'm sure you've got some new and improved tips to be able to share with us. I think that's true. Nelson, I know that you are out of Edmonton, Alberta, and you travel across the continents to be able to do your workshops and coaching. So your website is Great Staff Recognition. Nelson, tell us your story. What makes you the expert about hiring employees? I started hiring people in the same way a lot of people do. It was something you kind of get thrown into. I got a call from my boss's secretary, and there was a vacancy. He needed to fill it right away. I was the person he put in there. My job was to hire. I had no training, no experience. He told me that, that, well, we know that then maybe 10% of the decisions you make, hiring decisions are not going to work out. Well, I think the number is probably higher than that. So I was finding that I was, I I wasn't happy with it. So I started doing research, attending courses, taking courses, did a lot of reading and to kind of develop it. And over the years, I probably have done, well, several thousand interviews from people at a receptionist desk, frontline kind of positions, right up to CEOs. And I've been involved in hiring hundreds of people. And to be honest with you, making more hiring mistakes than I choose to admit to. Well, it sounds like a, a story that's very relatable. Somebody said, oh, by the way, would you? And you do. But then you find that there are better ways to to do that process. So now you've created this into your consulting practice and you provide a a variety of workshops and books and newsletters on the topic about hiring and managing employees. That's what I do. Yes, I have well one workshop, which is called, coincidentally, Interview Right to Hire Right. That's usually a full day workshop. And I've done that quite a few times. I have a number A couple of shorter ones. One is called Unlucky When Hiring, and it talks about the 13 reasons that managers are often unlucky and how to avoid making those same mistakes. And I'm working, I have a new one, which I will be presenting uh, next month in February in Las Vegas, and it's called How Would Sherlock Hire? And it takes, it applies the investigative skills of detectives of fiction, film, television, to the hiring process and how what they do has similarities to what we do as people who conduct interviews. That sounds like a lot of fun. So Nelson, I want to ask you one question as we get started here that I ask all of our guests. We want to talk about the elephant in the room. So every practice has a pink elephant. It's that problem in your organization that just never quite gets fixed. Like kind of scrambling and and hiring people at the last minute and not being prepared for interviews. So we want to address that elephant in the room and make that process better. Nelson, what would be your number one tip for clinic managers, healthcare providers of small healthcare practices about hiring employees? I think my number one tip would be look at the people you have working for you. And look at the ones that you would describe as your top performers. What do they do? What makes them successful? And be 
be really careful about how you answer that question. You know, don't say, well, they're great at customer service or they're well organized. You know, go deeper. Ask yourself to explain exactly what that looked like, what that means. And then that information becomes the basis of developing interview questions, because what you want to do is you want to hire more people like the top performers, the people who are making you successful. So from that information, you develop your questions for your interviews and also for your reference checks. Okay, that's a really great indicator about how people are going to do if you can identify what your top performer does already in their practice, so that you've got a a realistic expectation about what bar the new people should be achieving in a reasonable period of time. That's correct. And basically, another way of describing it is who do you want to clone? Mm -hmm. If you could, who would you clone on your staff? And every, you know, it's like, I, I sometimes draw the analogy to the Olympics. You have a lot of great performers that go to the Olympics, but only three of them reach the podium. Well, in your in your workplace, who are the three people who would be on that podium? Doesn't could be people you work with now, people you've worked with in the past. You could even put yourself among the top three performers in that type of position. So we've we we know what our goal is going to be. Now we just need to put the process in place so that we get more of those top performers. That's correct. And I think what I encourage people to do is hire staff in the same way. We choose mutual, mutual funds. Now, you if you want to buy a mutual fund and someone says, you go, go to a person that sells it, and that person, they're not going to ever t- say, and we guarantee you that this mutual fund is going to make 10% or 20% or something like that. But what they will do is they'll say, here's a chart. Look how this per- fund performed in the last year, the last three years the last five years, what we're going to do is we're going to, we're, we're going to make a prediction based on that past performance. And that's the same thing we want to do when we hire people. We want to find evidence of what they have done in the past, because that's the best predictor of how they'll perform in the future. And uh, so we're not asking people to make promises to us. We're not creating situations where they say, oh, I think this is what I would do, because frankly, we have no evidence they've done it. We're looking the fact they have done the right thing and they have done it in the right way. Nelson, why is hiring the right people important? Why should we be putting this effort into hiring people in our organizations? Well, people are what make the organization successful. The right people make it more successful. You want to bring in people that fit the culture of your organization and are in line with the values and purpose and mission of your organization. You want to have people who will come into your organization and they'll feel they belong there, that that's someplace where they're comfortable, comfortable being themselves, that they feel valued for who they are. And those are the people who are going to stay because the other thing you don't want to do is hire someone and have that person leave after a few weeks or a few months because every time someone leaves, that there's a financial cost, you lose productivity, you have to commit, commit time to finding the replacement and getting them up to speed. And every time you bring someone into the organization, you're putting the culture of your organization at risk. So you want to make sure that person has values that align with what makes your organization the success it is. It, it creates a lot of frustration and angst in the organization if you've constantly got a, a rotation of staff, isn't it? Yes, I've come across a couple of places where there's a sign and the sign outside the business or on their trucks or something says, we're always hiring. Well, I know what they're trying to say, but the message I read into that is you're always hiring because people are always quitting and nobody really wants to come to work for an organization that has some reason that everyone is coming in the front door and out the back door. I have a friend who's a a clinic manager, and she is so busy replacing people who are unavailable to work or vacancies that they haven't filled yet, that she hasn't been able to fulfill her role to the best of her ability about what a clinic manager should be, because she's answering the phone and booking patient appointments. Yes. And she's also probably putting a lot of time into recruiting replacement. Every time there's a vacancy, 
there's all kinds of pressures on you to fill that vacancy right away. You know, you know, in a clinic, it's you know, it's patient, you know, patients. They want something to be happening. They want to be, you know, dealt with more quickly. You know, the staff that's there, if there's a vacancy, that means they're probably working hard. They put pressure on them. We put pressure on ourselves. And all of those pressures sometimes cause us to make decisions more quickly than we have to. You know, the adage that uh, we should hire slowly and fire quickly is, is really valid. We really should take our time because I guess Lee Iacocca says the most important thing that a manager does is hire the right people. And and that, that's true. If you're hiring the right people and keep them in place, it's going to make your job so much easier. Well, that's a great segue into the next question. When we're talking about hiring the right people, it takes some time to get those things in place so that you can prepare that hiring process and, and prepare the interview questions. Why should we spend time preparing for an interview? What's what's the investment that we're making here? The investment is that we're going to get better results by putting the time in. We're going to ask the right questions. I'm not much of a fan of always asking, having just this one set of questions that you ask everyone, because each position is going to be different. And there's going to be, you know, different kinds of questions you ask. And even looking at the person's resume or application, there'll be information that comes out from that that you want to, you want to clarify. And that's one of them. Often when I do an interview, the first thing I do is I look at someone's resume, and I ask questions about what's in the resume to get a little more information about what kind of work they've done in the past. I look for gaps in their employment, things such as that. That would be different. But the time you invest is going to give you better quality questions. Better quality questions will lead to better decisions. I think it was David Frost, a British interviewer, said something like the test of the quality of a question is the quality of it. If you ask good questions, you're going to get good answers. You're going to get the kind of information you need to make a prediction as to whether this person is the right person to hire. There are a lot of things that we should be preparing for as part of that interview process. What activities do you think is important in preparing for interviews? Well, I think one thing you want to do is take a really careful analysis of the position. Know for sure what you're looking for. Because if a, someone's been in a position for a few years and they're, they're, they're retiring, for example, that position will have changed in that time. It will have go, evolved. So I think you have to sit down and analyze it. Or this may be an opportunity to redistribute work and, and look for different specific skills that you want to bring within the organization. So you do that and you want to put a panel together so that you have a it isn't just one person doing this. It's several people talking about what kinds of questions will be asked and how they'll be asked and so that you're doing that. And you, for each question that I would ask in an interview, I'm going to also want to think about what are the follow-up questions? Because I'll ask a pretty broad question to begin with, but I want to get more details. And I, I find it much better to have planned those supplementary questions out before the interview rather than trying to be creative on the spot which some of us have at times find very challenging. Right. And and then it makes it difficult for doing comparisons. If you've interviewed more than one applicant, if you're asking entirely different sets of questions, it's really hard to come up to a conclusion about which one might be the most appropriate for that, for yeah. that position. I think it's essential to ask the same questions of all the candidates for a, a given position. You may have different questions for different positions, but for the uh, it's just fair. I mean, it's fair to the candidate, but it's also fair to your, yourself, to your organization, because you're you're able to compare people on the same against the same criteria. And that's one of the things I do before I go into an interview. I say, you know, what is the criteria? What is an acceptable answer? What is an unacceptable answer? And what kind of answer would I expect to hear? from a top person that has the potential to be another top performer for the organization. Nelson, in your training, you talk about behavior description interviewing, or BDI. Can you explain what that is? Yes, we're asking people to describe what they have done. I've compared it to the difference between a documentary and a crystal ball. A crystal ball, you're looking and you're trying to guess what the person would do. Or you ask them questions like, what would you do in this type of situation? And they can they can tell you anything they want. They can give you the theory that they learned when they were going to school or what's in the textbook, or they can tell you what they think you want. 
but there's no way of knowing that that's really the way it's going to be. In BDI kinds of questions, we're asking them to describe actual situations, actual recent relevant similar circumstance descriptions of how they handle a particular situation that you've asked them about. Can we use a couple of, of, of scenarios to develop some workshops on some common questions that we might in, ask our applicants in a clinic? Okay, let's do that. Okay. So in our clinics of all kinds, we will have patients that complain. They're complaining that they're, they're waiting longer than other people who were in the waiting room after them. And the, having the front office staff being able to manage those complaints is a skill that we need for our front office staff in our clinics. How would you go about preparing an interview question that kind of explores that skill level? Okay. One of the things I tell people is you want to keep it short and simple. The fewer words you ask. Actually, one time I, I said to people, could you tweet your question? And mm. that was back when it was 140 characters. And in fact, if you, it gives you a challenge, obviously, to get it down to that word. But you want to keep it quite simple because you just want to get them talking about it. The patient who has a complaint, it would be something like this at a time when a customer, a patient, a client had a, a complaint. That's it. It's not even a question. It's really a request for information. Okay. okay. So I want to get them talking. Now, this creates a situation where the person can talk about how they've handled the situation, how they, you know, how they, you know, calm the situation down. Or you, know, you might have people that go off on a tangent talking about how unreasonable patients are in their demands on health, the healthcare system. Well, that may be true. But it, it doesn't sound like the kind of person that you want in the office meeting your clients or your, your patients when they come in. Okay. So if we have people that patients who make a complaint and we, we've met as an interview panel before the interviews with the employees and, and we've identified that Roxy is a rock star in our clinic and we know that Roxy handles patient complaints really well. So we know that she would acknowledge the patient, she would empathize, she would provide an explanation, and then she would provide an action. So one of her responses might be, I'm really sorry to hear about that, Nelson. I know it's often hard to wait. We try to see patients in the order of their appointments, not their um, time that they arrive. Let me see what I can find out and I'll get back to you. Yes. So if that's what our top performer would do, now that you've asked the interview question of somebody who is a candidate, then how do you get to the point where you determine whether or not the, the candidate has met their requirements or how they would rank against that top performer? I would have a, a ranking scale. And what you just described, Roxy's approach would be five. Okay, that's a top, that's a top performer. There might be someone who rated as a, a three, and that might be someone who's was, you know, kind of sympathetic to the person said and, and would acknowledge, you know, it's frustrating when you can't see, see, get in to see a doctor when you think it's your turn, and and maybe just leave it at that. Maybe that would be an acceptable response, not as good as you might hope for as, as Roxy would do. And then you have the person who basically would say, well, I just tell them everybody has to wait their turn. That's it. And that probably is not the person you want to hire because that is not the person that's going to make your patients feel that they're coming to some place where they, where people actually care about who they are and value in this. So okay. how would I get to that? Having said, you know, describe a, a time when a patient complained and if it wasn't detailed, I would want to know things like, well, when did it happen? How did you respond to that? What did you say? How did the patient res respond to, your, to what you said? What was the, the outcome, the results, the long-term relationship with that patient? You've got prepared some follow-up questions or some questions to help that applicant to expand on their, on their response. That's correct. Yeah, that's another way we keep make sure all the candidates are treated equally is we would do that. And the way I set up is I have a sheet that I would have in front of me when I'm asking questions. I would have that kind of that initial question there. 
And then I would have all my other ones. And I would actually set up like a checklist. And if they'd already told me, responded in there, giving me the information I was waiting for, I'd just check that that off. But if they didn't, then I would, would ask that. One of the other little tips I give people is take a vow of silence. You know, really, this is not a conversation between two people. You're there to learn as much as you can about the candidate and in a very limited time. The more you talk, the more you tell the, the candidate how to answer the question. A talkative interviewer is likely to hire themselves and the candidate gets the paycheck. Even going back to that original question, I, you'll notice I just said, describe a time when a patient had a complaint, period. I, I didn't even lead them along by saying, how did you respond to that? Because I want them to volunteer as much information as possible. So I'm going to ask really short questions and I'm going to make them very broad. And then we'll use the supplementary questions to narrow it down. But I will be doing exactly what you're doing, asking follow-up questions to clarify it and to learn more about the person. Okay. So when you're preparing for the interview, you have already learned what the critical skills are that person who's going to fill that position should have. And you have that job description, you'll have identified who your Roxy is, your rock star performers are, and why are they rock star performers, and what key, key skills that they have. And then you're going to interview to be able to ensure that the candidates have those key skills or not. You'll have a list of questions, and the questions will be tweetable, so they'll be very short. And you'll have some supplementary questions available to, as reminders to the interviewers, if needed, to be able to help them probe for additional information. You'll have a criteria, a way to grade those responses. So number five is, you know, the exactly what you were looking for. And you will have already determined what, you know, the best answer could be is somebody who walks and talks and looks and acts and like Roxy. And then a number three would be somebody who kind of is on the way, but not quite there. And a one would be somebody who didn't really answer the question fully, didn't have a good response, or you just didn't like the response. Is that about right? That's right. I summarized okay. very well. I wish I'd thought of saying it that way. Just <laughs> yeah, that's basically how it happens. And yeah, let me kind of just along while we're talking about questions. One of the problems that I run into over the years is people who would you would ask somebody a question, and they'd start responding, and then all of a sudden they realize they they had forgotten what the question was. Mm. So um, came up with a solution. Learned it from someone who was hard of hearing who. I was interviewing for a position. And so what I now do is and I'll just hold this up and I have no idea what the question is, but this is that initial question. And I will actually have it on a card and I will hand it to the person I'm interviewing so they have it in front of them. It makes a huge difference in the quality of the answers I get because it gives them something that they can refer back to. It gives them something, you know, occasionally they'll write notes on it. Sometimes they'll fold it up and so on. They can also hide behind it. You know, it's something, you know, people are nervous and it's some place to send their nervous energy. So it, it, I, I um, did this one interview and, or for one position and it was, it wasn't meant to be an experiment, but I forgot to do the cards for a couple of interviews. And then I introduced them and what a difference it made. It was probably unfair to the first two people, but it really was demonstrated that I will never go into an interview without having those cards with me again oh that's a great tip i like that yeah i think it works there's no scientific proof that it works but based on my experience it it works and i'm it seems like a good tool to use and the other reason i like that is it really helps you know as the clinic as the organization you're going to be doing a lot of interviews for these positions over a period of time just because of the nature of the work that you have so having those tools already prepared is going to help that next person that maybe it's the new clinic manager who's never done an interview before if you've already done the preparation on how to prepare for interviews of for a receptionist then it's going to make it easier for them to do that job too Oh, yes, it's, it's, it's good. Perhaps I should say something. One, I have a newsletter that comes out. I try to do it once every two weeks. And in each issue, I actually include a sample question and explain why you might answer that question and how you might score that. 
I'm sure most people would never use the questions I make up because they don't relate to a lot of places, but they do relate to some organizations. And it, I try to vary the types of organizations that I use them for. But it just gives people kind of a, a model they can use to develop their own questions. Yeah, and I've been on your newsletter list for a long time, and I've looked at those questions, and they often, if they're not directly related to, to the type of work we do, they I can often make them relate. So they're a great tool. I love your newsletter. Well, thank you. Okay. Are, are you up to workshopping one more type of question? Sure, and I'll try not to be as long-winded. Well, it'll be faster now that we know how the process is. So one of the questions that I'd like to ask is to try and get at how people would respond to a physician when they give the employee confusing instructions. Now, one of the things that we have a problem with is communication. It needs to be clear and consistent. And a new person walking into a clinic might be intimidated by the physician or the dentist or, you know, that that big person in the organization. So the question might be, how would you respond to a physician who gave you confusing instructions? Okay. And How would you change that? I would change it to something such as describe a time uh, when you the instructions you received from your supervisor were confusing. Perfect. That's okay. tweetable. That is tweetable. And just to kind of go back what we just did, I mean, often the people will have questions and by just moving that question from how would you do it, how would you do it in the future, to how did you do it? So mm. to do that. Little issue that will come up is with candidates, they will hear a question that you don't ask. They will say, oh, he's asking how I would do it. And they will start saying, this is what I would do. And you'd say, no, let's stop there. I want you to come tell me about what you have done. Tell me about your experience. Okay. And it, but it's so easy for them to, the candidates to go off into the future. Sure. Which is where we're going, but we want the information from the past, from those mutual funds, so we can predict the future. Okay. So let me ask you another question. When you've got a candidate who's coming to this interview and we're doing things a little bit differently than perhaps other interviews they've attended. How do you explain to the candidate that I'm, well, I have some questions I want you to answer when you think about your experiences in the past? How, how do you phrase that? How do you introduce it to them? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because I have the tool here. This, oh, is, wonderful. Something I, this is something I give people who, who attend my interview right to hire right workshop. That's a whole, whole set of cards that they can use that they can carry into the interview. I have an introduction. With your permission, I'll just read it. Go right right ahead. Okay. The process we're using today is called Behavior Description Interviewing, or BDI. We will be asking you to recall specific work-related circumstances or events. We know it can be difficult to come up with these examples. It's okay to take a moment or two to think about your response. Don't feel that you have to give us an example of some big event or task. Often smaller examples will provide us with the information we require. Don't feel you have to go into great detail. If we feel we need more information, we will ask. Let me give you an example of a type of question we might ask. From time to time, work teams are created to take on a specific task. Describe a time when you were part of a team that was given a specific task to complete. In your response, we'd like you to tell us when and where the team was created. Describe the task assigned to the team and recall how the team went about completing the task. Who assembled the team? What was your role in the team? Was the team successful? What challenges did the team face? And how did it meet those challenges? There it is. If you do that, you, every question, I'm going to be really happy with the reason. You're going to give me lots and lots of information on which I can predict whether you're the right person or not. Right. And having that on a on a card will help everybody be able to focus on the question. Yeah, I mean, this is a card that I read to them. I don't give it to them. Right. But it's just I give them kind of a template for answering the questions. Okay. So I have the cards. Oh, you have the cards. Okay. <laughs> 
that was from a long time ago when I attended your workshop. Well, um, I'm looking at them and I realize the copyright date is a long time ago. So yeah, they've been <laughs> okay. around a while. They've been around for a while, but they're they're very useful. Okay. So Nelson, we've talked about why it's important to interview right so that we can hire right. We've talked about what BDI questions are, and we've had a couple of example workshop questions. Is there anything else that you want to highlight for clinic managers, healthcare providers about tips to interview so that they can hire those right people? You know, the thought that comes to mind right now is something that we often neglect. One of the mistakes that we make is we waste reference checks. And so maybe I'll talk just a bit about that. First of all, most people will tell me, and it's my experience as well, that letters of reference are worthless. I mean, I have had people come to me and ask for a letter of reference, and I say, oh, certainly I'll write you a letter. What would you like me to say? And that's happened. You know, Mm -hmm. the, the letters are scripted by the candidates. They're not going to go to someone who who is is going to write a a bad letter or nobody's going to hand them a bad letter. So what I do with reference checks is I I will ask the candidates to provide me with names of people I can contact and get their permission to do that. And they will probably come to the interview with three names and all the contact information. I will actually ask for two or three more names because my line will be something like, it can be difficult to get a hold of people. Okay, I do references checks after the interviews, and I only do reference checks on the people we have tentatively selected. Okay, it's to confirm what we believe, because I want, you know, I don't waste my time or the time of the people I'm calling to get the references. In the references, when I do them, I don't say, do you think Gene is a great person? Do you think we should hire Gene? Because, frankly, I don't know who that reference is. They're a stranger to me. And our parents have always told us to be careful about talking to strangers. Okay. These aren't people I know. Okay. So what I do is I will ask the same kind of questions as I ask in the interview. Let's use those two examples we were working with. Can you describe a time when Jean had to, or Roxy or whomever had to deal with an upset patient? First of all, I, I'll get an idea of the quality of how they did it. This is not people what people expect to be asked. Then I can compare the response I get from the reference to what the candidate told me during the interview. Are they aligned? Take that second question regarding, and that one may be more difficult to ask, especially if it was the supervisor who gave confusing things, but basically it's saying, you know, describe a time when Buxy was confused by the instructions she received. Okay, and can talk about how she asked questions to clarify or whatever this happened. So that do that. Interesting thing happened. I was involved in hiring a CEO for one organization, and I was doing a reference check with the chairman of the board, of the candidates, so on. And it was quite a lot. I mean, the CEO is supposed to be a fairly serious exercise. You want to make the right decision. And so it was quite a long reference check. And at the end of which the chairman said, did I get the job? Because he'd gone through a very long interview process for me to get learn about the person that had been working for him. And the wonderful thing is, we hired her away from that, and they hired me to manage their process to replace the person I'd just taken away from them. And it was like getting paid twice for the same it's job. It's win-win. It sounds great. Yeah. But so that would be one thing. What else might I do? I think the other thing is when we're hiring, we should take, think long term. Often it's like we got a vacancy, we got to fill it. No, you've got a vacancy today, and that person could be with you for 10 years. Mm. So you want to make sure that you, this is somebody you can live with for 10 years so or longer. That's a good point. Thank you. So, Nelson, you've given us a, a lot of help for those clinic managers who have suddenly been told that they need to hire somebody that they may have never had had any hiring experience. 
And I wanted to to thank you for that opportunity and to let people know how they can keep in touch with you and, and get those nuggets of information and find out more about the workshops. What's the best way for them to reach you? Well, we, they can phone me and maybe, uh, you know, one thing, go to my website, subscribe to my newsletter. That will give you contact information. One of the things you can do is you can actually schedule a time for a complimentary telephone conversation, consultation, whatever you want to call it, for 15 minutes, except they usually go longer because we get I get interested in what they're interested in. And, and it's it's a way of getting contacts. Um, so you can do that. So that, that might be the best way. My email address is N as in Nelson, M as in Mother Scott, S-C-O-T-T, at telus.net. And my phone number is 780 232 3828. And your website is greatstaffrecognition.com. That is correct. Yes. Okay. So we can subscribe to your newsletter there and find out more about your workshops and give you a call to find out which is the best fit for for their needs. I would appreciate calls. I love just talking to people. (laughs) I know you do. Okay, thank you, Nelson. I I also wanted to let people know that this interview with Nelson is also included as part of the resources in our new product called the nine steps to hire and to keep employees in your healthcare practice. So the course includes a PDF book from me, and it also includes the process about the nine steps to hire employees. So it has nine steps, nine modules with a short video, and many Microsoft Word templates to help you get started in creating your job descriptions, your job posting, your interview questions, your candidate ranking scores, your performance reviews, and right up to the exit interviews as part of that whole hiring process. So connect with Nelson to subscribe to his newsletter and also take a step over to see our new product, Nine Steps to Hire and Keep Employees in Your Healthcare Practice. And that's at informationmanagers.ca forward slash nine, the number nine dash steps. Thank you, Nelson, for joining us again on Practice Management Nuggets podcast. Yeah, just a a, a quick comment that... Your resor- your course sounds like a wonderful resource that will be very helpful for people. Thank you. I think it will be. Thank you, Nelson. It's great to be with you again. And I look forward to seeing you again on the podcast and perhaps on your, you know, your new workshop in, in the States. And best of luck on your new book. Okay. Thank you so much. Until next time, I'm Jean Eaton, your Practical Privacy Coach and Practice Management Mentor with the Information Managers. Stay tuned. I'm excited about this new season, and I'd so appreciate your help to spread the word with your colleagues. First, make sure that you subscribe and add a review on whatever podcast platform that you use. Next, take a screenshot of this episode that you're listening to right now and share it on your Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or your preferred social media channel. Remember to tag me and I will reshare your post. When you share the show, it makes it easier for people just like you and who like what you like to find the show. Until next time, this is Jean Eaton, your practice management mentor and your practical privacy coach.